The Passion Translation is not the best Bible translation for anyone I can think of in any circumstance. Except for this one, it is the best Bible translation for me to critique in this video. That's kind of it. You've landed in my Not the Best Bible Translation series. I've already done one critique of the Passion Translation, or TPT, as I will call it often in this video, and I'm actually planning to do at least one more video on TPT, but my first video was relatively brief, and I think there are more important points of criticism to raise. But my theology, my Bible, leads me to reach for positives before I turn to critiques, because I don't think there's anything in this world that is completely bad. Satan cannot create. He can only take good things God created and bend and twist them out of their intended shape. So at the bottom of sin is always something good. I therefore think it important theologically to say that extremely misguided and misleading and even heretical Bibles are not 100% bad. God's truth shines so powerfully that it can shine through the dark curtains of obscurity that fallen humans sometimes try to place on it. And insofar as TPT functions as a paraphrase, not a translation, it has moments of real light and beauty. Does anybody truly object to these words from TPT taken by themselves and not as an effort at translation? That is, if you heard these words I'm about to give from TPT in a sermon as a spontaneous paraphrase from your pastor, you'd say a loud amen, wouldn't you? Where then is there room for boasting. Do our works bring God's acceptance? Not at all. It was not our works of keeping the law, but our faith in his finished work that makes us right with God. So our conclusion is this. God's wonderful declaration that we are righteous in his eyes can only come when we put our faith in Christ and not in keeping the law. Now, a lot of this really is just translation. And if you didn't know that justified means declared righteous, reading this paraphrase could help. That phrase too is very arguably a translation and not a paraphrase. Like Peterson's, Eugene Peterson's The Message, TPT goes back and forth on the formal to functional to paraphrastic spectrum of Bible translations we've all seen. Sort of like a snake slithering this way and that on a horizontal pole, looking for a way down. Or take this line from Galatians 3.1 in TPT. What has happened to you, Galatians, to be acting so foolishly? You must have been under some evil spell. At first, I assumed that Simmons was being too free, like... Um, a rattlesnake on a pole that is shaking its tail too vigorously. Would Paul really say that? Did he believe in evil spells? But then I remembered the standard translation bewitched from the King James of my youth. O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? But when I read TPT, I had a tiny moment of insight, a tiny jolt of my mental wagon out of a very old mental rut. Affected by an evil spell is precisely what bewitched means. Arguably, I think, Simmons has said this in our English rather than sticking to traditional English. That's really, really hard to do and do well. Tradition has a powerful hold. BDAG itself, the standard Greek English lexicon, supports Brian Simmons' read here, even his footnote. Indeed, as Simmons points out and BDAG agrees, the Greek word used here means to cast a spell using the evil eye. Simmons says that Paul goes on to use a pun here in the Greek. And Simmons may be right. This is perceptive and shows good study. If he is right, his paraphrase nails it. Didn't God open your eyes to see the meaning of Jesus' crucifixion? Wasn't he revealed to you as the crucified one? I liked this little line too from 1 Corinthians 13. Love never stops loving. That's his paraphrase of love never fails. This is what paraphrase is supposed to do. It's supposed to bring out little nuances that more straightforward traditional translations may not feel the freedom to display. And as I often say, only the Bible, God's word, is worth this kind of attention, lavished attention, but it is worth it. And I didn't have to look hard at all for these examples of good in TPT. Also, I alluded to this in my interview with a very young Kate Shelnut of Christianity Today in my previous TPT video, but I know two refugees from more straight-laced forms of Christianity who have found in TPT what they feel to be the heart of God. They think the crowd we all kind of grew up in was too buttoned up, too apt to deny the place of emotion in the Christian life. I think they're onto something, though I think my tradition has done a good bit of self-correcting in the last 20 years. This is kind of what my dissertation was about. 
I am still pretty straight-laced, however, and I think these two friends are making a mistake and swinging the pendulum a bit too far the other direction. I have told them so. They appear to have accepted my words in love. But I am never, ever going to deny that God has done good for my two friends through TPT. I strongly suspect that good is exactly what God has done for them. Praise his name. If God can plan good through the evil of Joseph's brothers, he can plan good through the woolly-headed work of a genuinely gifted, extreme charismatic who thinks God expanded his brain capacity and taught him hidden secrets about Hebrew, hidden secrets that every serious scholar thinks are simply false. Indeed, I've got to turn now to negative points about TPT. My work on KJV onlyism makes me feel keenly that it really is important to get our bibliology right. Just because God can do good with messed up things doesn't mean we should pretend they're not messed up. And the doctrinal sins of TPT will have an impact. You reap what you sow. In this video, I'll make three points. First point. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Mike Winger here on YouTube has done excellent work on TPT. I really hardly need to say anything about TPT. I'm way late to the party, actually, because Winger has been doing an over-the-top excellent job on this. He actually hired some big-name evangelical scholars who absolutely know what they're talking about to critically evaluate TPT. We're talking Doug Moo, Craig Blomberg, Tremper Longman. The names hardly get bigger in evangelical biblical studies. These are men who have proved their skill in evangelical academic Bible study over decades. If these names don't mean anything to you, I'm sorry, but you're reading the wrong books, or at least the wrong commentaries. Not that I agree with every last thing every one of them does, especially Jumper Longman. And each of these scholars so far has found TPT gravely wanting, while insisting on the same truth I have been in this video, that it's not 100% bad. Mike himself, Mike Winger, comes from the more charismatic wing of the church, the same place, very generally speaking, that the Passion Translation comes from. But even he is both weirded out and alarmed by the wild claims that TPT progenitor Brian Simmons makes. I dearly wish, here's an aside, that some non-Ruckmanite King James Onlyists would dedicate themselves to rooting Ruckmanite double inspiration out of their movement as Mike has worked to display the errors of this charismatic Bible version. Back to the main task. Mike is also more familiar with the New Apostolic Reformation than I am. I cannot speak intelligently to the charge that some people have made against TPT, namely that it uses technical terms from that theology. I just can't verify this claim at this point. I, I haven't done the necessary reading. I am the very model of a biblical philologist. I'm not so great a researcher nor much of a theologist, at least when it comes to NAR. I'll leave this point to others. Second point, but don't you dare get to thinking that it's going to be short like the first one. Again, point two, there is no hidden love language of God. When I first somehow found my way to the Passion Translation website, I went straight to the explanations of its backstory, its theory of translation, its reason for being. These are standard for English Bible translations. They're the first thing I read. And I encountered very confusing, even evasive, and it turned out upon later inspection, simply untrue statements. When I talk with lay people and non-specialists, as anyone in any field will do, like an engineer or something, I bite my tongue when they use technical terms improperly, like saying, using the word manuscripts to refer to printed Greek New Testament editions. There's a significant difference between handwritten copies of the New Testament and printed books, a difference that specialists always observe. But I know what people think they mean when they make this mistake, and editors need friends too, so I don't go around correcting little errors like this all the time. But I was very much put off to see the formal explanation of principles on the website of a purportedly serious Bible translation committing this very error, and then following it up with a statement that is so vague as to be meaningless and threatening at the same time. Here's what the site said. As Brian has studied the original biblical manuscripts, I, again, this should not have been manuscripts, but probably languages, he has uncovered what he believes is the love language of God that has been missing from other translations. I trained hard and I work hard to find the good in everything, but for just one moment, please, please let me take my academic hat off and speak the truth the way Elijah would speak it if he were reading this up on Mount Carmel in a contest with the priests of passion. That last phrase about the missing love language of God, that is the fourth stupidest thing I have ever heard. You don't even want to hear the top three. One of them was said by a politician, if that tells you anything, and the other two by a famous barista. There is no 
no love language of God missing from other translations. This is 21 dumpster loads of nonsense, a claim that simply must have been created by the top writer of infomercials on TBN. Perhaps Brian Simmons' guardian translation angel was talking, or he was on a journey, or maybe he was sleeping when this sentence was written. Okay, academic hat back on. No, no, you know what? My academic hat is back on, and I'm still on the verge of spluttering. I'm gonna have to put on my backup academic hat on top of this one to coax myself back into the sober speech that viewers have come to expect on this very straight-laced channel. Why can't people be happy with the Bible God gave us rather than demanding something different? What in the world does it mean to uncover the love language of God? The love language of God has never been covered except sadly for those people into whose languages the Bible has not yet been translated. How can they hear without a translator? There is certainly nothing in TPT that displays the heart of God with more clarity or depth or feeling than do any of our existing standard evangelical English Bible translations. The only way TPT can have more feeling is if Brian Simmons added in some feeling that was not placed there initially. We'll see this in a second. This particular line is so emblematic of TPT, though. It really feels like a snake on a horizontal pole that's into jazz. Everywhere I looked in TPT, I saw Simmons just kind of taking Bible phrases and jazzing them up a bit, sometimes a lot. And I don't necessarily see a huge problem with this if you openly advertise that this is what you're doing. Please buy my new jazzy snake paraphrase. It's like the old snake, but with jazz hands. If that's what he did, I could accept renderings like this. Since we are those who stand in holy awe of the Lord, we make it our passion to persuade others to turn to him. The Greek doesn't say passion. It just says we persuade people. There is no Aramaic original, we'll get to this in the next point, that adds a note of passion here. I actually looked up the alleged Aramaic original word, and there's no way that even it has more passion than the Greek one. Here's another example. It is Christ's love that fuels our passion and motivates us because we are absolutely convinced that he has given his life for all of us. The inspired Greek says what all the standard English translations already say. Christ's love controls us or constrains us. And then it says, they say, and we are convinced. Simmons just tossed in that word passion again and he jazzed up the Bible text by adding that Paul was absolutely convinced, not just convinced. And it's not as if Simmons doesn't know what the Greek is saying when he does this kind of thing. In a footnote on the phrase, God's passion is burning inside me for you, this is Paul speaking, he says, Simmons says, just what the Greek says and just what the standard translations say, or godly jealousy. And this leads me to my next point, though you'll have to follow me. This is the most academically challenging part of this video. Point three, the idea that Aramaic originals stand behind the New Testament doesn't even count as fringe. When Brian Simmons left that footnote that said, or godly jealousy, where was that coming from? I can't be absolutely certain, but I'd be willing to bet five snakes on poles that Simmons was giving a literal translation of the Greek. I don't think he was citing the supposed Aramaic. I live in the academic biblical studies world, the evangelical academic biblical studies world, and I have never in my life heard a serious person argue that there are Aramaic originals of the New Testament. Before I try to unpack what Simmons says about this, just listen to this wording I got from his website. Quote, in recent years, we have made many new discoveries regarding the original documents and manuscripts that have been compiled to form our Bible, especially the Aramaic manuscripts of the New Testament. One of the unique benefits of the Passion Translation is that it has recovered this often neglected language by consulting these ancient biblical manuscripts, all so people can better encounter the fiery, passionate heart of God. To bring the full texture of God's word to the surface and recapture the original essence of the teachings of Jesus and his disciples, Brian, this is Brian Simmons of course, has compared the Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic translations throughout this monumental project. You may consider the Passion Translation as a blending of these. 
it's hard for me to explain how all this strikes me. I once likened it to a bunch of gearheads at an auto shop who know cars like the back of their grease-stained hands. In comes a new guy who thinks himself a gearhead, who wants to be considered as one. He's listening to the real gearheads talking shop about the drive shaft going into the rear differential. I had to look this up. I'm not a gearhead. And then he pipes up and says, well, of course, we have to carburate the front shocks. The guy successfully used car words. Each of them appears in the automotive dictionary. But what he said was meaningless. He simply does not talk the language of gearheads. He doesn't know what he's talking about. If he wants to name parts of the car differently or use idiosyncratic terminology like turning carburetor into a verb, carburate, he'd better demonstrate beyond all doubt that he can fix a car or no one will have any good reason to listen to him. Even then, they'll try first to get him to use accepted terms. Until then, till he demonstrates what he can do with a car, they will just know intuitively that there's no point in conversing with someone who's so out of touch. They will look at him like a rather pretty eighth grade girl looked at me once when I, a lowly seventh grader, pulled my chair up to the cool kids table at lunch at a multi-church winter camp and she literally said to me, I'll never forget it, who invited you? We have not made many new discoveries regarding the original documents and manuscripts. And why use both of those words, documents and manuscripts, that were used to form the Bible? And there are no Aramaic manuscripts of the New Testament. Also, there is no way to compare the Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic translations of the Bible because the Hebrew and Greek are not translations. They're the things that get translated. The site goes on to describe something that makes a lot more sense. There's a place in the descriptions of TPT where Simmons is described as working from the Hebrew and Greek, but incorporating insights from the Syriac, that is Aramaic, Peshitta. I'll explain this a little bit more in a minute. That I can at least grasp. That is in fact what Simmons appears to have done. So why did he have to say it so confusingly in different places? When I first looked at his site, I got the distinct impression, and others on the internet have seen this too, We've, we wondered if the site has been changed, that Simmons was just translating supposed Aramaic originals. Indeed, the TPT site says there's sort of a new movement afoot in biblical scholarship to raise these Aramaic texts to the status of the originals or higher. He was so confusing even here. I, it took me a while to realize that he had to be talking about what everyone calls in biblical studies the Syriac Peshitta. Peshitta is actually just the Syriac word for common, exactly like Vulgate, and very much like the word standard in the names of many of today's Bible translations. It's very much non-standard to call this Syriac Peshitta Aramaic. And I admit, I am not entirely sure what to make of this. I admit, I did not know that the language of the Syriac Peshitta was related to the Aramaic that many people, including me, presume Jesus spoke. But I absolutely did know about the Peshitta. I have it in Lagos, and it simply should not have taken me as long as it did to realize that when Simmons said Aramaic originals, what he actually meant was the early Christian translation of the Bible we know as the Syriac Peshitta. A little side note here, I spent an hour plus on the phone, uh, Google Meet, just recently with somebody uh, who lives in Britain who is a member of, of the clergy of the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church who memorized the entire Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, in the ancient, no longer spoken, still used liturgically language of Ge'iz. The fact that I wasn't super up on this ancient translation, the Syriac Peshitta, doesn't mean that I've missed out on something major any more than Brian Simmons might be wrong for having used the Syriac instead of using Ge'iz. Ancient translations of the Bible are just that, ancient translations of the Bible. They are kind of a photocopy of the Bible. That those photocopies are useful because they're so old, but they are just translations. I'm going to give another illustration of how Simmons' words hit me. I really i am just trying to get this across to you. It's like a modern obstetrician, okay, an OB in a white lab coat going to a meeting with a hippie midwife whom an expectant mother is related to and therefore also wants to have present at her birth. And the midwife says, Dr. So-and-so, did you know that babies at this latitude actually have double the chi of most babies? You'll need to use extra crystals. If you're this white lab-coated OB, you're thinking, this person is crazy, but I can't say that in front of the mother. She wants her here. So you say kindly, well, I, I wasn't planning to use any crystals, but if that's what the mother wants, 
and the midwife suddenly mixes up your world and hers by saying, oh, countless studies have shown that crystals help with your chi. This hippie midwife has just used an appeal that is supposed to work in your world. She appealed to research. And at that moment, you can't actually prove the universal negative. You can't say with honesty, I've read all the studies in the history of the world in every single language that there is, and I am confident that not a single one of them says any such thing. Likewise, I can't say to Brian Simmons, no, there are no scholars alive who think that the New Testament was originally composed in Aramaic. I don't have universal knowledge of all scholars. But this is why we have traditions and guilds and popularizers and schools and diplomas and annual book awards and conferences. We have gatekeepers for validating information or not for invalidating information, as the case may be. And if I live my entire life in the midst of the evangelical biblical studies community, and I never hear a single reputable or even disreputable person say, actually, we've recently discovered what appear to be Aramaic originals for the books of the New Testament. If I never hear such a thing, I feel safe, at least for now, in dismissing the first upstart who says it. Maybe more facts will come in. Maybe the fundamental tenets upon which my discipline has been based since at least the Protestant Reformation, I would say back further, are horribly wrong. Maybe I wasted years learning Greek instead of Syriac or Ge'ez. <laughs> Maybe in the eyes of God, I'm the one wearing tie-dye and Brian Simmons belongs in the white lab coat. I should be on the fringe. He should be the mainstream. Maybe I do need to get a manual paradigm rather than an automatic so I can shift into his gear. And maybe I can't say in front of your mother what I really think of Brian Simmons. And even if she wants him in her Bible study, I'm gonna have to ask the hospital security guards to keep him out of the room. It simply is not true that we have Aramaic originals of even a single one of the New Testament books. And that means that what Brian Simmons has done is to combine a fairly traditional translation of the Hebrew and Greek, which he often does actually pretty well, with some weird fringe, not even fringe, linguistic ideas that I'll describe in the next video, a good helping of emotive paraphrasing, and some insights from an early translation of the Bible, and actually a recent English translation of that translation, one I'd never heard of. He takes all these ingredients, some of them precious and important, and some of them fruitcakey and he mixes them up in a way that only someone who can read Hebrew and Greek can start to untangle. And he says, Simmons does, that the spirit expanded his brain capacity. I'm not making this up to be able to do this work. So I come back to a theme I brought up at the beginning of my first TPT video. People think I'm gung-ho about all new English Bible translations. I'm not. I told Christianity Today that you should read TPT only after reading all the other committee-based translations on your local Christian bookstore shelf. And I did mean that. But I said that because I'm not into book burning. <laughs> Tell freedom-loving Americans they are not allowed to read a particular book, and I promise you they will read it to spite you. <laughs> so let me put it this way, then. I would be happiest if TPT did not exist or if it were ignored, as I fully expect it to be in time to come. The main value I see in TPT is that it allows people like me a foil, an opponent, against which we can restate the orthodox view of inspiration and translation, which is that only the Hebrew and Greek are inspired and only they should be translated. Translations are not inspired. And certainly, paraphrases that incorporate insights from a translation of a translation are not inspired. Let this be one lesson you learn from TPT. We actually do kind of need Bible scholars because sometimes the challenges to orthodoxy are subtle and complicated, involving multiple ancient languages. I came across at least three great articles on TPT written by Bible scholars that represented a ton of work. I'll link them in the show notes. I myself am trying to toss a little of my own work into the mix through this video. I'll do a little more in the next, Lord willing. But let this be the major lesson you draw from TPT. Be grateful for the amazingly good standard translations you have. Use them. Read your Bibles. We have more good ones than we can shake a snake at. We don't need TPT.